Hey guys, welcome back to another video. So a couple of days ago, I was with one of my friends that's currently doing an internship at one of the big banks here in Canada. And we were looking over some of the code that his manager wanted him to optimize. And the conversation kind of went something like this. Hey man, how's it going? Pretty good, pretty good. My manager has been telling me to do some code optimizations. There's this one method that he wanted me to reduce the memory usage because it's taking up too much memory. But I haven't been able to think up of any ideas. Oh, okay. Do you mind if I take a look and see if I could come up with a solution? Yeah, sure, let's go. Okay. I think we can use an iterator for this. Uh, what? And that's why I decided to make this video. So I'll be going over what iterators are, their advantages, why I think many developers still don't use them, and finally, I'll be going over the code that I looked at with my friend and how I would use iterators to significantly reduce the amount of memory I used. But before we get into it, first I would like to show you the code that my friend showed me for those of you that also want to come up with a way to tackle this problem and to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. So here we have our snippet of code and our culprit function, do something. This was the only piece of code that I was shown I don't know who wrote this, could be a full-timer or could be a previous intern, but to keep it anonymous and not leak any proprietary information, I changed all the variable names and removed all the non-essential parts of the function. It takes in three parameters. The first two are Java RDD objects, which are part of Apache Spark. The last parameter is not that important, it's just a string representing a file path. Inside this function, we first call a collect method on our brdd object, which creates an array that populates it with all the results in brdd. Then we get the second element of our array and do some operations on it. Then we create another list of strings calling some other function. And now we do the same thing with ARDD, calling collect on it. Then we call a union function on A lines and B lines. This union helper function basically creates a new list and copies the values of A line and B line. Along the way, we also print out some log messages. We combine everything together into a big list at the very end so we can prepare it to be written to a file. Finally, we call our output to file function which takes in a list of strings and writes them out to a file using an elemental for loop. So some things to take into account is we pretty much never used any of the results. We only needed to count how many results we got and then write it out to a file. So iterators are basically an abstraction over iterations. For example, traditionally, if we want to go through all the elements in an array one by one from the beginning to the end, we would have an index that starts from zero and go to length minus one and we would use a for loop or a while loop and go through each element by using the index. But often we don't make use of this index variable and we only use it to access the element in our array. So iterators lets us use what's called an elemental for loop that instead of using indexes, we can just go through all the elements one by one using an iterator. This iterator starts from the beginning and goes to the end of the list and gives us the items one by one. Now you might be saying that doesn't really change much and you're right. For this specific example, it doesn't really change anything. But anything that gets remotely complicated, say now we want to go through all the keys in a hash map, and the keys are stored in some sort of binary tree. Well, now we have to implement our own breadth-first search or depth-first search to get at all the keys. And we have to implement a stack or a queue to keep track of all the keys. So you can see that it gets complicated pretty quickly. Whereas if we just have an iterator that's already implemented for us and all we need to do is just run a for loop over it, it's a lot more simpler and our code looks a lot more cleaner. Like in Python, we can just use a for loop that goes through all the keys in our dictionary. So another solution to this is we can go through all the keys using breadth first search or depth first search and then putting all those keys in an array. And then we iterate over that array using an index. That way we can get at all the keys. The problem with this is that now we're using additional memory. We now have duplicate copies of the same keys, which for my friend's situation doesn't really work out because we're trying to reduce the amount of memory we want to use. And that leads into our next point. Iterators usually take up constant space. So no matter how big your array or your list or your hash map gets, the iterator is only going to take constant space or O of one space, which is really good for our situation since we're trying to reduce the amount of memory we're using. And the last thing is, iterators work very well with functional programming features, such as map, reduce, filter, fold, and so on. And this could significantly reduce the amount of code you need to write and read. For example, if we want to find the maximum value in an array, 
we would first need to have an if statement that checks if the array is empty. Then we would set a variable to the first element of our array. And then we would go through using a for loop, starting from the second element all the way to the end. And any elements that's bigger than our current variable, we would set our variable to that element. We can just use the max function that takes in a data structure that can be iterated over. And it would just go through one by one and find the maximum value without us having to code out all these edge cases and have all these extra variables. And I'll go into more of this in a little bit. But now let's get into why I think many developers don't really use iterators. Now I will say beforehand, there are some reasons to not use iterators. If you're just starting to learn programming, you probably don't want to use iterators. You'll learn much more coding it out yourself and learning it along the way. Another reason would be, sometimes iterators actually make the code harder to read. In that case, you would just use a for loop or a while loop or something else. Okay, so the first reason why I think people don't really use iterators is because it's not really taught extensively in school. Professors rarely go over iterators in detail because a for loop or a traversal algorithm will do the same thing. And most likely they'll want you to use those traversal algorithms that they're teaching you instead of using code that's already been written for you. So the most you'll use in school is probably an elemental for loop, unless you take a functional programming course where they teach you Haskell. The second reason why I think iterators are underutilized is because the languages being taught does not support iterators very well. If we take a look at the popular languages that are being taught in school today, we have Python, Java, and C. Python probably being the language that's taught to students when they first start programming, and Java being used to introduce students to object-oriented programming, and C being used to introduce systems programming and memory management. Out of these languages, only one, Python, has decent support for iterators. C doesn't facilitate any iterators unless you do them manually yourself. And Java's iterators are very lacking in features, with only four methods available to their iterator and iterable interfaces. Okay, so post-recording, I realized that Java has the streams package, which implements a lot of the things that I was looking for. But I think there's still some work that needs to be done. It's still not really taught in school. And there seems to be some non-trivial solutions to converting an iterator into a stream. So if you were just programming normally, you probably wouldn't go out of your way to search how to convert an iterator into a stream and then do all your operations. And I'm sure there's other languages out there that doesn't support iterators very well. Compare that to more modern languages like JavaScript, Scala, or my favorite, Rust. You can do much more with iterators. If we just take a look at the methods available to Rust iterators, we have any returns true or false if any of the elements in our iterator satisfies a predicate. Chain combines two iterators into one that goes through the first one, then the second one. Count counts the number of elements in our iterator. Enumerate adds indices to our elements. Filter filters out all elements that doesn't satisfy a predicate. We have find, min, max. Partition that splits the iterator into two collections that's defined by a predicate. Skip skips the first n elements. Take or take while. Take the first n elements or keep taking until the element doesn't satisfy a predicate. Zip combines two iterators into one that goes through both of them together. So you can see how some of these are very useful and reduces the amount of loops you would need to write and variables that you would need to use. Okay, now let's get into our examples. Okay, so here's the solution I came up with from my friend's code. So this class I implemented before I learned about Java streams, but essentially it's just a class that holds a bunch of iterators and goes through them one by one. With the new code, I no longer use this class because we can use streams. But if we're using an older version of Java, or if we're using classes from third-party libraries that doesn't support streams, then we would have to use this extra class. Okay, so before we get into the changes, let's take a look at the original code first. We see that when we convert our Java RDD object into an array, that's essentially doing a copy of data. So now we have two copies of the same data. And we're doing the same thing with ARDD and BRDD. So now we have two n or two times the amount of data that we originally started with. Then we have our files lines variable, which is a union of B lines and A lines, making another copy. So now we're at three copies. Finally, we do a union on files lines and new lines, creating another copy of B lines and A lines. And now we're at four copies of A and B. And we do all this work just so we can have it in one list later to output to a file. Now let's take a look at the new code. We do essentially the same thing 
in terms of converting our RDD into arrays. We could have avoided this by using the to local iterator function that converts it into an iterator, but we wouldn't be able to use it with streams since converting between iterators and streams are a little bit more complicated. So instead we have our two arrays from before, but now instead of creating multiple new lists with the same data inside, we create our stream that combines all of them together. We have our B lines that creates a stream. Then we concatenate A lines as a stream to it, and then concatenate new lines as a stream to it, and concatenate our sum text at the very end to it. And then we convert our stream into an iterator and pass it into our output to file function. And if we take a look at our output to file function now, I've changed our list of strings to an iterable of strings. This way we can pass in anything that can be iterated over. And if we take a look at how much memory we've used, we've only copied the values inside our Java RDD once, and that was to convert it into an array. If we had some sort of stream operation on our Java RDD class, then we wouldn't have needed to even create an array for it. Now I understand this is not how you would usually use Apache Spark. Usually you, you wouldn't be working with RDD objects. Instead you would just convert them into datasets for more performance and efficiency. And doing a collect or a iterator function on Java RDD classes is going to use up a lot of memory because all the distributed computing gets isolated into one. So I'm not really sure why they have this code here. This is just how I would approach this problem in a general sense without having any knowledge of Apache Spark. And that's about it for this video. Hope you guys learned something new. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.